in the Mahayana, when we talk about wisdom practice or Vipassana practice, mainly we're talking about this wisdom of emptiness. So these three marks of existence here The first insight is an insight into impermanence, the fact that everything's changing moment by moment. The second insight is an insight into suffering in terms of what is the human condition, and we'll look at uh, that in more detail in the session after lunch today. and an insight into no self. And we'll be looking at that, uh, touching on that idea a little bit on day nine when we look at the, the wisdom of Vipassana practice. So therefore, in the Theravada, when they say they're doing Vipassana practice, they're really meaning trying to gain these three insights. Whereas in Mahayana, when they say we're doing Vipassana practice, we're mainly talking about gaining this wisdom of emptiness. This wisdom that there's no independent me, no independent world. Everything's interdependent. And we'll again look at that in day nine, what that really means. So that's the wisdom. And then the compassion wing of practice... <clears throat> at the foundation level, at Theravada level here, um, we're cultivating four qualities called the four immeasurables. Uh, often in the Theravada, these four immeasurables are called the four Brahma Viharas. And these are four, the four qualities of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. And these are the four qualities we are moving through in the uh, session after lunch. So yesterday we looked at loving kindness. Today we'll be looking at compassion. Um, tomorrow we'll be looking at empathetic joy and equanimity. And then in the Mahayana, in the compassion wing, uh, we build on top of those four immeasurables to what's called bodhicitta. Again, a Sanskrit word. Uh, body means enlightenment, chitta means mind. So this is literally the mind of enlightenment. It's the mind which is, aspires to enlightenment for the benefit of others. And we'll be touching on this idea um, in a few days' time in that session after lunch. So the session after lunch where we're dedicating to compassion, we will be moving through these four immeasurables and then moving into uh, this idea of body chitta in a few days' time. And day nine, when we go into Vipassana, we'll be looking at these uh, insights here, the three marks of existence and this insight into uh, emptiness. So that's sort of the terminology we use for the three main core areas of practice in both Theravada and Mahayana. So just sort of to keep that as the framework for the coming days. So let's now go back and do a little review on the shamatha practice that we're uh, looking at. So of course in the shamatha practice we are cultivating these three qualities of relaxation, stability, clarity. And they to emphasize them in this order. First, establish a good basis in relaxation in the body and the mind. On that basis, we work on improving stability of attention. And then with a more stable and focused mind, we improve the clarity of attention. So in this order. And we saw there that in this practice, uh, we can focus on any one of many different objects. And the general recommendation is use the object that works best for you. But in this particular retreat, we're focusing on three objects, particular objects that um, I think uh, 
very beneficial for particularly us in the modern world. So far, so far we've been using the breath and that's the one that's most widely emphasized and that's the one that's probably going to be the best object for most of us, at least initially. And we're going through a number of variations of the breath practice. The full body and the rhythm is good for relaxation. The abdomen we did yesterday, good for stability. And the nostrils today is particularly suitable for improving clarity of attention. And then tomorrow we'll be moving to observing the mind. The following day, this resting and awareness practice. And then the following day, we're going to combine those two resting in awareness while observing the mind. So they are the objects we're going to use in this uh, retreat. And each one has its own unique benefits. Um, and we can use any one of those objects, of course, for shamatha practice. Tools. What tools do we use? We saw there there are two main tools, and we saw they are symbolised here in this diagram with the rope and the hook, that the rope is the rope of mindfulness. That's the main tool. So we are tying our mind with the rope of mindfulness to the object. So remember here, mindfulness is simply our ability to hold the object, to not forget the object, to focus, hold the object. But then, of course, we need a second tool, this hook of introspection, which is like quality control. <clears throat> introspection is monitoring that mindfulness how is our mindfulness going? Are we still holding the object or are we starting to become dull or distracted? And if we are, then we simply reapply mindfulness to the object. <clears throat> so to talk a little bit more about those two tools, I'd like to go to, again, this attention revolution from Alan Wallace and see how these two tools are being described by some of the uh, earlier Buddhist masters from ancient India. And so first he's quoting from Buddha Gosa, uh, I think a 5th century master within the Theravada tradition, and he says the following. And this is what Almol says. Buddha Gosa drew this distinction between mindfulness and introspection. So he's quoting Buddha Gosa now, who says, mindfulness has the characteristic of remembering. So remember, uh, smirti, sati, the original terms, literally means to remember. Its function is not to forget, it is manifested as guarding. Introspection has the characteristic of non-confusion. Its function is to investigate, it is manifested as scrutiny. And then Alan Wallace says, and his contemporary Asanga, so Asanga was a great 5th century Buddhist master in the Mahayana tradition, he says, and his contemporary Asanga offers a view that is strikingly similar. So he's now quoting Asanga who says, mindfulness and introspection are taught for the first prevents the attention from straying to the from the meditative object, while the second recognises that the attention is straying. And now he's quoting from Shantideva. He says, Shant a great 8th century master in the Mahayana tradition, Shantideva's definition of introspection appears to reflect both these views. So now he's quoting Shantideva who says, in brief, this alone is the definition of introspection, the repeated examination of the state of one's body and mind. And then back to Alamos, he says, throughout Buddhist literature, the training in shamatha has often been likened to training a wild elephant. So we see that here, here the wild elephant of the mind. And the two primary instruments for this are the tether of mindfulness or the rope of mindfulness and the goad or hook of introspection. So these are the two main tools we use in this practice. Of course, of the two, mindfulness is the primary tool. And if we simply improve our ability to hold the object, if we improve mindfulness, our ability to monitor that just automatically improves as well. And we saw that in um, this practice, the two main imbalances, faults, are dullness and distraction, or in the text, the technical words is laxity and excitation or excitement. And to uh, balance the mind, we can balance the mind by particularly on the out-breath. Out-breath is a natural time to relax 
to, to, to relax any tension and to release any distraction. So relaxing and releasing on the out breath helps overcome tension, agitation, distraction. And the in breath is a natural time to sharpen the focus, to help us overcome dullness and laxity. So by relaxing and releasing tension and distractions on the out breath and sharpening the focus on the in breath, we can really balance the mind. We can have a relaxed mind and alert mind at the same time. But of course, in terms of dullness and distraction, um, prevention is the best cure. So there are certain things we can do to help prevent the arisal of dullness and distraction. So of course, in general, um, one of the main reasons we get caught up in dullness and distraction is we've simply lost interest in the practice. Like everything in our life, if we don't really have any interest in what we're doing, we're just going to get sleepy and get caught up in a lot of distractions. So similarly, if we're only doing this practice because someone told us to do it and we're not enthusiastic about it, we're just going to go into complete dullness and complete distraction. So therefore, if you find that you're not enthusiastic about the practice, we need to develop that enthusiasm. And we can do that by, as we saw, to how to overcome laziness was to reflect on the benefits of the practice, to really appreciate the benefits of these practice and see that they're going to give us a lot of benefit. Then we're going to be enthusiastic about doing the practice. And of course, it's also very helpful to set a good motivation for doing the practice. And when we're setting a good motivation, it's very helpful to include others in our motivation. Because if our motivation is only we're doing this practice so we can benefit, then often when practice gets a bit difficult, we're likely to give up. However, if, we, if we've included others in our motivation, that we're not just doing this for ourselves, but we're doing it so we can benefit others, then we're more like, it's a much more expansive motivation and we're more likely to persevere if it gets a little bit difficult because we're doing it for others as well. So I highly recommend to include others in your motivation for doing this and all practices. And another reason, common reason, we get caught up in a lot of dullness and distraction in meditation in general is we simply try, we're meditating too long. We're meditating too long. And we've lost, we, we can't sustain it. So... The general recommendation as a beginner is to keep the sessions short and to always emphasize quality over quantity. Because if we try and meditate too long, we're not going, as a beginner, we're not going to be able to sustain that. And what's going to happen in the latter part of the meditation, we're just going to go into complete dullness and complete distraction. So therefore, keep the session short. How short will depend on us as an individual, our capacity. But in this retreat, we're mainly doing about 20-minute sessions, which I think for many of us as beginners is a good amount of time. It, gets, it gives us an, enough time to get into the practice, but not too much time that we just sort of fall into complete dullness and distraction. But some of you may find that 20 minutes is a little bit long. You might prefer to start with 15. Some others may find that you can actually do a little bit more, maybe 25, even 30 minutes. So pick an amount of time that works for you and stick to that. And then, of course, to go further into the practice, we'll, we will need to go, we will need to eventually meditate longer. So how to know when to extend the amount of time you meditate? One way of uh, evaluating that is if your normal experience is that at the end of your meditation session, your normal experience is, oh, I would have liked to have done a little bit more, then that's a good sign that it's time to increase. But don't go from 20 to 40 minutes, three to five minute increments. So if you're doing 20, maybe 25 minutes. But always emphasizing quality over quantity. And if you want to meditate longer in the morning, maybe you want to meditate 30 minutes every morning, but you can't sustain it then do a little bit like you've been doing here before breakfast. 
Break it into two 15-minute sessions with a little two-minute break in the middle. So always emphasising quality over quantity. And that's going to help prevent dullness and distraction. Now, there are, of course, a, a, a number of other things we can do to help prevent dullness and distraction. One, of course, is posture, the body. Because if we're sitting here like this, then we're, we're just going to get very dull. So, again, keeping the back straight is going to be particularly helpful for overcoming dullness. And then, of course, the eyes. If we're the sort of person who naturally tends to become quite dull... I wouldn't recommend meditating with eyes closed. You're just going to fall into dullness. Then to have the eyes open, either partially or naturally. If you're, but if you're the person, sort of person that naturally gets very agitated, you may find actually uh, keeping the eyes closed, certainly as a beginner, might be helpful. So that's something we can adjust depending on the type of person we are. And, of course, the environmental conditions uh, will have an impact so if we're meditating in a, in a place that's too warm, too stuffy, we're just going to fall into dullness. So don't meditate in a place that's too warm. Uh, and if it's too cold, you might get just sort of agitated. So um, we can adjust the temperature of where we meditate. Particularly at home, if we have air conditioning and eating, we can adjust it so it's not too hot and not too cold. Um, also, of course, one of the... Big reasons, particularly in the modern world, why we, why we fall into dullness in meditation is we simply do not get enough sleep. You know, in our modern world, we have very busy lifestyles. We're always busy, 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 busy. We never have enough time for everything. So what we do, what we cut, is we cut sleep. So from eight to seven to six to five to four hours. And somehow we manage to get by with more coffee and so forth. This is not going to work for meditation. So we need to make sure we get enough quality sleep. Otherwise, you're just going to fall into dullness. Meditation sessions will just be sleep sessions. <coughs> and also, of course, not a good idea to meditate after a heavy meal. Again, just dullness. Um, and another thing that is really talking about meals, that's another thing that can create not only a lot of problems in terms of uh, distraction, but dullness is uh, diet. Uh, you know, there's a modern day epidemic of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There are a number of reasons for that, but one of the main reasons is diet, particularly sugar. Sugar is a disaster for meditation. So if we're having a lot of sugar, you're just going to go up, down, up, down, agitation, dullness, agitation, dullness. It's not going to work. So we need to make sure that we have a healthy diet and particularly cut down on sugar intake because it's not really going to be very useful for meditation. And then, of course, at a deeper level, why we often fall into dullness and distraction is we've some, simply lost interest in the practice. So again, if we find that we're not interested in the practice, we need to reflect on the benefits and have an expansive motivation for doing the practice. Then we'll be enthusiastic and we'll be able to um, get into the practice. And then one last point, and we'll go back to the shamatha practice of the nostrils, is our worldview. We talked about this yesterday. If our worldview is that the source of my happiness and suffering is coming from out there, we're just going to get distracted because we're going to be constantly looking out there for nice things, trying to avoid unpleasant things. Um, so we need to really shift our worldview to understand that the source of suffering and the source of happiness is coming within, and this shamatha practice is the gateway to that happiness, that genuine happiness. This is the gateway. And then we'll really be enthusiastic to do this practice. So that's just a few things we can do to help um, prevent. Oh, one other point actually I forgot to mention is for distraction, one of the big distractions as a beginner is noise. Noise. So very helpful to try and find a quiet place to meditate where you live. If you live in a noisy environment and you don't have a quiet place, then I really recommend... Uh, noise-cancelling headphones. I use them a lot. 
whenever I'm in a noisy environment. Very, very helpful. Very helpful. Okay. Let's go now back to the practice. Uh, a few more comments about the practice of entrance, the focusing on the breath at nostrils, and then we'll go back into the practice. So for this, um, again, I'd just like to read briefly from Alan Wallace's Attention Revolution on page 46. He says the following. Mentally, the initial emphasis in shamatha practice is, not, is on relaxation, which can be induced by attending to sensations of breathing throughout the body. The second emphasis is on stability of attention, and for this it can be helpful to observe the sensations of breathing in the region of the belly. Then having established a foundation of relaxation and stability, we shift the emphasis to cultivating clarity of attention. It is crucially important that stability is not gained at the expense of relaxation, and that, and that the increase in clarity does not coincide with a decrease of stability. The relationship among these three qualities can be likened to the roots, trunk, and foliage of a tree. As your practice grows, the roots of relaxation go deeper, the trunk of stability gets stronger, and the foliage of clarity reaches higher. In this practice session, shift the emphasis to clarity. You do this by elevating the focus of attention and directing it to a subtler object. Direct your attention to the tactile sensations of your breath at the apertures of your nostrils or above your <laughs> upper lip, wherever you feel the in and out flow of your breath. Elevating the focus of attention helps to induce clarity, and attending to a subtle object enhances that further. Observe these sensations at the gateway of the breath, even between breaths. <coughs> there is an ongoing flow of tactile sensations in the area of the nostrils and upper lip, so sustain your attention there as continuously <coughs> as possible. If the breath becomes so subtle that you can't detect the sensations of its flow, quiet your mind and observe more carefully. As you arouse the clarity of attention, eventually the sensations of the breath will become ev evident again. <coughs> On the periphery of your awareness, you may still note other sensations throughout your body, as well as sounds and so on. Just let them be without trying to block them out and focus your attention single-pointedly on the sensations around the apertures of the nostrils. Count your breaths if you find this helpful. Arouse your faculty of introspection so that you quickly know whether excitation or laxity has arisen and take the necessary steps to balance the attention when such problems occur. One more comment and then we'll go to the meditation. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, as with all shamatha practices, we are using what's called bare attention. So we are observing the object directly. And the object here is the actual sensations in this area. So in this practice, we're not visualizing or imagining the breath coming in and going down, going up and going out. That's visualization. So we're just focusing on the actual sensations in this area. And as I was mentioned, if you find again that you're heavily distracted, a lot distracted, and you find it helpful, you might like to introduce a bit of counting or noting the breath as we did yesterday to help stabilize the attention. But counting breaths is not part of the normal practice. It's something that we can add if we find we're heavily distracted and it may help us to stay more focused. So it's only a temporary short-term strategy. And as we get deeper into the practice, uh, we'll need to let go of it. So what I would recommend is only use counting if, you f if, you, if it's necessary and you find it helpful. If it's not necessary or you don't find it helpful, just leave it out. Okay. So let's do that practice again.
setting the body into a state of relaxation, stillness, and vigilance. The breathing flowing naturally and effortlessly. and setting the mind in a state of ease and relaxation. Simply allowing it to come to rest in the present moment. And simply becoming aware of the rhythm of your breath. <laughs> 